my name is Mickey Lippy. My name growing up was Mickey Glassman. Uh, I'm Jewish, grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. When I got married and found out my name was going to be Mickey Lippy, I wanted to change my name, but couldn't really think of anything better. My husband and I were living in State College, Pennsylvania. I had gone to college in commercial art. I'd been a greeting card designer in Boston, but I always had wanted to build things. My mother was a master seamstress, and so was I at that point. I finally found someone who would teach me the fundamentals of making jewelry. He taught me to make jewelry with a plumber's torch. And anybody who's watching this and knows anything about torches knows that that is not what you would want to make jewelry. You would let it rest on your shoulder, and then you would use the torch like this. But I did learn the basics. And then Bill and I moved to California, and I took a graduate level course there. And I was introduced along the way to the Smith Little Torch. And that is very key to the kind of work that I do because you really can't do what I do with any other kind of torch. The tips and the flame are very small, but very hot. And it allows me to spot solder. I took a workshop many years ago from an instructor, and he said that you should let your surroundings influence your work. And I think I really have. There are pieces from uh, Oklahoma, and of course in Oklahoma the soil is red and the horizon is flat. You know, they say that you can see Amarillo from Oklahoma City. So that was, that was a big influence. When we lived in Charlottesville, Virginia, it was a pretty amazing experience. I had a studio in a building with about 30 other artists. And that was a really, uh, needless to say, rich environment to work in. There was one other jeweler and myself and then there were all kinds of visual artists and everything you could imagine. Then we moved from Charlottesville to Yellow Springs, Ohio. I had a small studio. I shared the studio with the goats. When the snow crashed the goat shed, the goats were in the room next door. And I could hear them gnawing on the wall. We were living in Seattle, and my studio was in the basement. And my good work time was from 9 to about 12 at night because the kids were in bed and I had quiet time. And I was down working in my studio, and I was feeling kind of frustrated. I, I wasn't totally pleased with what I was doing, but I wasn't sure where to go with it. And I got the idea of totally simplifying things. I would only work with squares, circles, triangles, and rectangles. It just clicked. I'd just gotten started with it, and my husband came downstairs. He came into the studio, and he was so excited. He'd been reading Stephen Hawking. And he understood it. And he's a scientist, but not a physicist. So it was a very sort of good moment for both of us. And then I started making the orbit necklaces. And I was purchasing something called snake chain, which is a very smooth chain in both square and round, and making the circles, squares, triangles, rectangles, and bits of stone and bits of tubing that became my signature pieces for a very long time, the orbit necklaces, because everything orbited around you. 
And um, I was using a bimetal made by a fellow named Phil Baldwin, and it's sterling silver and 22 karat gold fused, which allowed me to have the color of gold without the really high cost. I also decided that two parts to this. Um, I couldn't do it all myself, and, uh, and also mentoring. It seemed like it would make sense to have people working for me. I had a series of assistants, and we did an exhibition. It's very heartwarming for me to see the ones that have stayed in jewelry. Quite a few of them are still making jewelry and participating in the field. And then when I didn't have kids at home, um, I decided that I should share a studio. So I've done that. And the jewelry has become all about leaves, twigs, and berries, or had become. And because I joined a women's hiking group, not too long after moving here. So the forest became the fuel for my jewelry. So when I moved my studio out and was on Jackson, I just began to notice that there was very interesting trash in the street. And I began to collect it. And, and then it, it got to the point where I decided that that was what I wanted to feature in my work. And um, one of my friends looked at it all and said, oh, Mickey, you're such a magpie. So when I had an exhibition and we made a catalog, we titled it the Magpie Series. Um, and I, I want to just say that I call it trash. There's a difference. People often say found object. And I think that's too generic. This is really trash. This is what anybody else would have picked up and put in the trash can. So, but I think that speaks about what's precious to us. I really wanted to focus on using things that would normally be thrown out, but making them precious. I've always been uh, very community oriented uh, wherever we've lived and it's worked for me, it's helped me a lot. And um, when we moved out here, I had been a member of the Washington Guild of Goldsmiths when we lived in Charlottesville. And when we moved to Oklahoma, I actually started a small guild there. There were a few members. And then when we moved to Seattle, I uh, got in touch with a few people who I'd met and we started the Seattle Metals Guild. And that uh, was a very, very important part of my life. It was also like putting a match to dry kindling because it just took off. And, and we had officers and we had programs and it has flourished, I'm very pleased to say, uh, for all these 50 something years, I think. So we got the idea of having a yearly symposium and uh, some of the original committee members were myself, Andy Cooperman, Abby Frank, and I think Nadine Correa. The, the idea was to bring in artists from around the country and also Europe. We generally had one and sometimes two people from Europe Sharon Cranston would bring his books, and um, it became a major event. At that point, there would be an exhibition at Ficheri, and uh, the symposium, the book sale, and then we would end it all with a speaker's dinner. And it was quite the event, because living in Seattle, you're, you're kind of removed from the rest of the country, and it's expensive to fly to the NIC conferences and such. So we decided to just have our own event here, and it continues to this day. While living in Seattle, I, I just began to think about women in, in shelters 
who were victims of domestic violence. And I, one of the things was that I remembered in Oklahoma, the addition we lived in, there was a woman whose husband had abused her and he went back out to drink some more. And when he came home, she shot him with his gun. And she was originally arrested, but she was later released. And I just felt that I wanted to give back to that, to the community in some way. And so the question was, how could I give back the best? And it appeared to me that I should use my knowledge of jewelry. So the first thing we did was we decided we would make jewelry, and that lasted one day because we realized we couldn't make enough jewelry to matter. So then the idea was to collect jewelry that's sitting in a jewelry box and not being worn anymore. And we began collecting the jewelry, cleaning it and sorting it, and giving it to women in shelters. And when we first started that, it was, I would be told to meet a woman in a blue coat in a coffee shop. And that's how I would give her the jewelry. Needless to say, things have changed very much for the better. Um, and along the way, we started selling the better jewelry. At this point, we have quite a lot of money. I won't say an exact figure. And we have given out quite a lot of money. We began giving cash grants to the shelters. And most recently, Ridwell did a jewelry collection for us. So that jewelry is in the process of being distributed. And you know, every woman likes to have a little something to wear. And when you leave home because of domestic violence, you often just take what's on your back. So I mentioned uh, living all over the United States, but we also lived in Germany for a year. That was where the pieces in this case and on the other side were done. And they were actually made when I got back because I had an exhibition and the title of the exhibition was Time and Place. So it was one year living in Germany and I shared a studio with a German jeweler named Andrea Wippermann and the studio was at the base of the hill of a, uh, a jewelry school. We were living in Leipzig and the school was in Halle and I would take the train and the Strassenbahn every day to the studio and part of that year Bill and I spent a month in Italy and part of the month in Italy was walking on a lot of roads, not really trails, but small roads. And the pavement, the paving, or the gravel, was bits of pottery, shards, that the people had created and thrown down. So I would come back from a walk with my pockets bulging. So when I got back, I made this series of brooches with the shards that I had collected in Italy. So these are the roads. It's like they're sections of a map. And the shards are the villages. So this is would be the train track and then the roads. So those were the place brooches. And then I made something called warped time boxes. And they all have sayings stamped on them about time. And they're warped because your vision is of hindsight is often a little warped. When we moved here, I also became involved in Pratt Fine Arts Center. And I was on the board, and I was also teaching. And teaching comes very natural to me, but I think teaching is very important. And I, I developed a series of exercises that I would have the students do, which I felt helped them tap into their own creativity. One of the ones that comes to mind is 
I would have everybody bring a couple of file folders, and I would pass out scissors and tape, and I would say, just cut this file folder and make form. Don't think that that form has to be jewelry. But we all have certain constrictions that we put on ourselves, and it's important to let go of those. A friend of mine has a house in the Okanagan, and the forest fires had never come up as far as her house until some years ago when the fire did come that far, and her house and the forest around it were burned. She asked me if I would go with her the first time that she went up after the fire, and I collected a few bits of um, glass that had been in the house and a twig or two from the burned forest. It was a very surreal experience. In the places where trees had been, um, there was the form of the base of the tree and just uh, a little smoke coming up in the center. So I came home and I made these pieces to commemorate her house and the joy that had taken place there, the fun, the laughs, but also uh, the birds and the animals that could no longer live there. In 30 years, the forest will regrow um, and we'll see, we'll see. I, I think I would just like to end by saying how fortunate I feel to have been able um, to spend my whole adult life um, being an artist because there are a lot of people out there who don't, who have that ability, who have that desire, but don't get the opportunity. And I was fortunate.